First of all, I want to begin saying a big thank you to Reza and Marie for organizing this. Of course, to Huaping for writing this book, which has brought us all together to discuss it, and to everyone for being here in person or online. Especially thanks for inviting me, considering I'm an interloper, speaking to an audience of philosophers, although hearing about other people's academic journeys, perhaps we're all interlopers. <laughs> I am a historian who has made a home of sorts in international relations and political science and political theory. And my connection with Kant is primarily through my research on race and hospitality and how this has implications for the European project, for migrants and refugees in the West. But more broadly, I am interested in knowledge production and historicizing the coloniality of knowledge production, especially rooted in the Enlightenment. And of course, as uh, Huaping has already laid out in her presentation, no one looms larger in terms of impact and as a source of inspiration for many contemporary scholars other than Immanuel Kant. And his impact goes far beyond the realms of philosophy. Certainly, I see it and it's recognizable in my field as well. I want to first of all start off by acknowledging what a hugely important book this is. We are, of course, indebted to the invaluable work by philosophers of race and scholars of Kant over the past couple of decades reflecting on race in Kant's work. But as Huaping notes in her introduction, the common refrain now, especially in the post-Floyd moment, seems to be turning into, well, Kant was racist, what now? Or in effect, the refrain is, in less polite terms, so what? Right. So Wapping's book tackles that question head on, and I think utterly debunks the notion that Kant's racism, and as she helpfully defines it, his raciology, uh, debunks the view that this is just an intellectual curiosity and is inconsequential for his wider compendium of work. But rather, this book and what it tells us has profound implications, not just for philosophers, but for contemporary knowledge production at large which has invisible effects of the dissemination of ideas far beyond the reaches of academia. So I want to start with outlining, in my view, what I think are some of the most important contributions of Wapping's book. Firstly, just on a pragmatic level, Wapping's book provides a deep, granular engagement with an extensive range of the most important works on Kant and race, in which she not only brings those works together in a cohesive way, and situates them in relation to each other and Kant's legacy, but also provides her own clarity and assessment of the validity and utility of their arguments. This is hugely valuable in taking the conversation on this matter forward. For Kant scholars, I absolutely agree. This is a constructive intervention, but it's also useful for those who may be approaching this book from the perspective of race and knowledge production. The second major contribution, and I'm going to spend a bit more time on this one, is that Wapping moves the discussion, as you alluded to in your presentation, away from Kant as an individual to recognizing what Kant represents in a much bigger architecture of knowledge production. And therefore the role that he plays in, and I quote Wapping on page six, the formation of racist ideology. And I think as somebody who's worked quite a bit on how we define ideologies, that's absolutely accurate. I think this is, has all the hallmarks of, of an ideology. <laughs> so this focus on ideological formation, what does that do? It shifts the question from whether or not Kant renounced his views before he died, whether he was a moral egalitarian or not, whether he was an inconsistent one. In fact, in some ways, any commentary on his character whether he's good or bad is secondary here. This book is more about the power of Kant's ideas, which have grown into something much greater, more consequential, and in given contexts is potentially harmful as well. So in making this shift and focusing on bigger stakes, Wapping's book invites all of us, actually as scholars, to be more reflexive about our part and complicity in ideas that perpetuate injustices, our role in failing to challenge harmful contemporary political and social trends. And in many ways, the book also gives us a method for exploring the impossibility 
of abstracting our own work, be it philosophical or historical, from contemporary dynamics. We can choose and try to do so, and therefore inadvertently absolve ourselves of social responsibility. But this overlooks the extent to which our scholarship necessarily has a bearing on the world we live in, will be used by others to have a bearing on the world we live in through a reproduction and embedding of norms or a contestation of those norms. So this forces us to look beyond a parochial intent and purpose behind our scholarship and to engage with the responsibility that our roles place on us. It should affect choices about what knowledges we pursue, which ones we occlude, how we pursue that knowledge, and indeed who we give a voice to or not. And while it might not seem like it when put as simply as that, this practice might be seen by some to be very controversial because we are meant to view knowledge, right, in the traditional sense, in a totally dispassionate way as a pursuit of objectivity. And if we do so, we would not let these wider societal considerations get in our way. But if we see ourselves as scholars, as educators, in and of the world with a commitment to, for example, eliminating racism, then it might cause us to pause and think more and actually it should slow us down in our knowledge production. Yeah, it should actually slow us down. I am actually, this is an aside, I'm always skeptical of examples of superstar productivity in academia where one's publishing record is unattainably prolific. Because if someone is producing that much, there can be no space to be reflexive and to process the implications of the research that I might be doing on others. In contrast, if we were to see knowledge production in abstraction from the world, in abstraction from historical context, in abstraction from the subsequent impact of our research, well then we might safely be able to perceive Kant as working in a bubble, as if he's in a cave, as if his race work is just a part of his philosophical working out, right, before he reaches his end and real scholarly goals. And therefore, we wouldn't need to read any more into his race work. Right? That's what a lot of the scholars that have looked at this work have concluded. Now that, and this is a point that Huaping makes in the book and in the chapter that I was assigned, that means that, uh, that fundamentally must change if we were to give race, cancel race work, it's due. If we were to recognize it as having a huge impact, and as you said in your presentation, um, this work has taken on its own life, right? In many ways, as you mentioned in the book, this is actually about being fair to Kant, right? Let us not diminish the importance and power of his work on race. Let us not distort his own and what happened, you didn't say it, but I'm going to say it. His racist intent, I think he was a racist, I don't think he'd mind being called a racist. <laughs> His racist intent due to our own discomfort with it. And by the way, um, in a current climate where there is actually a serious backlash against this reflexive accountability work, to persist in this task requires a lot of courage, ethical clarity and intellectual rigor. And for that, I'm very grateful to Wapping because I think the book does all of that. So that was my second point in terms of the major contribution, a general contribution of the book. So of course, there are granular, more detailed contributions that each of the presenters will be speaking about when they um, tackle each chapter on its own. But thirdly, um, and I think this is an important point, be even if it's a simple one, this book is throughout lucid and refreshingly engaging in a way that does every justice to the depth and complexity of the philosophical debates, has the gravitas that one might expect from a scholar of Wapping's caliber, but it's also written in an accessible way. And I want to emphasize that um, being accessible is one of the highest compliments I can give to any work, especially theoretical work. So this book does a real service, in fact, in opening up intra-philosophical discussions to, to those who might be interested in philosophy, albeit not as philosophers, those who are interested in race, those who are interested in knowledge production, those who are interested in coloniality, those interested in historicizing ideas. The fourth really important contribution 
um, is, and here I address your subtitle, Views from Somewhere. Um, and thank you for elaborating on this point, actually, in your presentation. So this is an allusion uh, to the stamp standpoint from which one theorizes. Right? So as opposed to being from nowhere, recognizing that these ideas, our scholarship, our interpretations come from somewhere. Wapping addresses this at the end of the introductory chapter, and um, it plays a role, underpins many of the ideas in terms of not just how she explains her own positions, but the positions of other scholars of Kant. So standpoint theory is basically the notion that where you are located geographically, but also intellectually, what your experiences have been and how you identify has some bearing, often subconsciously, on your scholarship, right? So what you perceive or what you take seriously, what you overlook or deem irrelevant, these are choices that are made on the basis of our standpoint. <coughs> now, there are justified criticisms of standpoint theory, right? Especially, for example, when it might be used to restrict who gets to speak about issues of justice based on whether or not they've been directly impacted by said injustice or not. Right? And I agree with those criticisms. But I don't think any of those criticisms are applicable here at Wapping's book because of the context in which she introduces standpoint theory. So let's think for a moment about who has written about Kant and race. And while there is excellent scholarship on this subject, most of whom Hopping has included in her book, and with a lot of depth and a lot of fairness, so far the debate has revolved around whether Kant is or isn't a racist or demonstrates attributes of a racist, as if all that was at stake was his reputation in the pantheon of European Enlightenment luminaries. But consider that debate so far has largely been amongst those who probably have never experienced racism on a personal or community level. And that is not reflective of a wide-ranging, rigorous, and socially, politically, intellectually pluralist academic debate. Truly the time is right, in fact, overdue, to reflect on what Kant's racist ideology has meant for actual people, actual communities, and to explore those implications of the real, deep, empathetic understanding of the impact racism has on societies. Can we fully know the implications of Kant's race ideology without that insight? Right, without that actual contextual lived insight. So on that level, Wapping's contribution to Kant scholarship is indispensable. But in saying this, I want to provide a crucial caveat. So as a fellow scholar of color, who would sit presumably in Kant's oriental category classification, I'm fully conscious that the standpoint that scholars of color can provide has acted actually as an excuse for those perspectives coming from that standpoint to not be granted equal engagement from the mainstream of scholarship. As if it is rendered niche and peripheral, that it is concern for a minority in the field that I am from, in international relations, political theory, political science, I have learned that some scholars are taken as valid and equal interlocutors, while others aren't. And in some ways, we can see the impact of Kant's racial and moral classifications and hierarchies operating in unspoken ways within academia. So let me quote Huaping, who states on page 17, Kant has thereby carved out a capacious logical space to exclude entire populations on account of their racialized characteristics, including aptitudes, cognitive inabilities, and so on, from playing any agential role in the continued progress, human progress towards a species-bound moral destiny. So I ask, how far does this, 
which Huaping has just described there, play out in academia, in the politics of citation, in whose ideas are granted validation and whose not. So at this point, I want to um, provide an anecdotal story um, of an experience that I had. Uh, I think this would have been um, late 2016. And to give you the context, this was round about the time that I was reading and going down a rabbit hole with Kant and race when I was writing um, the article that Huaping alluded to. So I was fully embedded in it and thinking about it and thinking about the contradictions, non-contradictions. So at my institution, obviously, I'm not going to say who, <laughs> I'm going to keep the philosopher as well that they were working on um, anonymous. Um, but another scholar, very um, renowned scholar, um, arrived to speak about their new book on X philosopher, not Kant, also an Enlightenment philosopher. And um, they were extolling the virtues of this philosopher and their relevance to our thinking and questioning why they are not used more and isn't actually applied more in people's work and political theory, but in international relations more generally. Um, and as I mentioned, I was in the midst of writing or researching my article in this time. So I was really keen to know what, as a fellow scholar, is working on this Enlightenment philosopher, what her thoughts were on the issue of race, because it didn't come up at all in her talk. And she was talking about the role of emotions and taking emotions into account. And so I thought, well, what happens if, in this case, the fact that um, some, in some contexts, she's arguing this philosopher is, is suggesting that emotions are necessary and important and should be seen as um, on a par with and compatible with reason. Whereas in other cases, with certain races, that emotion precisely becomes the excuse and the means by which those racist, racial categories are excluded from intellectual engagement, excluded as being seen as having a role um, in civilizational progress because they are too emotive, right? How do we square that tension? So I asked her the question, what does she make of, of, of the racism in this particular philosopher's work as well? And um, let me tell you what her response was. It was very short and sweet. She said, oh, well, he said, philosopher, was very inconsistent. Right. He was inconsistent. That was it, full stop. And I found this really interesting, right? Because political theorists, as with philosophers, are able to go to such depths in understanding, right? And application with their chosen philosophers and their ideas. And yet, none of that usual approach seemed to warrant further curiosity in this particular case and so many other cases when it came to the matter of race or these so-called inconsistencies. If it's inconsistent, wouldn't you want to know more? So I, I tried to elaborate and tried to get her to shed more light. And then her next comment <laughs> was even more interesting, where she said, obviously I was asking about race, right? And in this, is this philosopher's work. And so she said, oh, well, you would know more about it than I would. And at that point, I thought, well, I'm very flattered, but I haven't just written a whole book on this philosopher who you really care about. Why on earth would I know more about them than you? a whole specialist on this philosopher. So this was interesting and it was very revealing um, in terms of how race gets treated, how questions about race get treated, how questions about race from particular <laughs> scholars also get treated. The implication being that because I was a scholar of color, this was a matter reserved for those who are from a minority background is not really a cause of concern for the mainstream. And we wonder why these fields lack diversity. So by the way, that paper culminated in, as, as was mentioned before, uh, the paper titled The Erasure of Race, Cosmopolitanism and the Illusion of Kantian Hospitality, it's open access in Millennium. Let me tell you that I really wish Wapping's book <laughs> was already out before I wrote that because it would have made my life working through so-called contradictions and non-contradictions so much easier. So let me move on to that now because that's the chapter that I was assigned but the rest of the book is is great and really builds on on this this chapter but this chapter which is where's the contradiction is I think very fundamental right in making sense of 
uh, the broader arguments in the book. I am not, I think actually Huaping did a really good job in, in outlining some of these in your presentation, of course. Um, uh, so I'm just going to summarize some of them. And I think some of these points in this particular chapter speaks to a number of the questions that came up in the previous session. So the first, there's a lot to take away. It's a, it's a dense chapter. Um, but the first thing that comes through very powerfully is Huaping's core argument, which is a so-called contradiction uh, between moral universalism on one hand and the racism or the race work or raciology in Kant's work on the other. The idea that this is a contradiction she, she lays out and she compellingly argues this is not in fact a contradiction. So I'm going to quote, she, she says, we are therefore confronted with a choice should we focus on Kant's core moral theory while abstracting from his racist attitudes or should we reinterpret his moral theory as inegalitarian to be consistent with his racial hierarchism. And then I think there's a brilliant passage where actually you, you provide a very pithy answer to this. So on page 35 to 36, I quote, overall Kant's philosophical system has such a complex structure that it can coherently include all of the following. Strictly universal claims about human beings as mere rational beings in his pure moral philosophy. Still somewhat abstract claims about the moral prospect of humanity as an earth-bound animal species with rational capacities in its pragmatic anthropology. Racialist but not yet racist claims about different human populations in physical geography and racist claims about who can or cannot participate as agents in the historical unfolding of his moral vision for the human species. So these can all sit together. They can all be contained. And, and the idea being that because Kant actually is brilliant, he's able to work out a systematic framework in which they can all sit alongside each other. Wapping's next proposition then for Kantian scholars on this contradiction, non-contradiction issue, and I would also say for political theorists specializing on other philosophers, this next proposition is key. It's the core of what makes Wapping's work so unsettling and disruptive in the best sense, because it would require a radical change in the way that Kant and other Enlightenment philosophers are taught and used as the bedrocks of moral philosophy and legal theory. And that is to be found on page 41 to 42. So I'm going to quote again. Wapping states, one, if one, so these are two propositions. One, if one reads Kant's stated moral universalism as unrestricted, namely as generalizable to all biological humans, while agreeing that he subscribes to racist <laughs> particularism, then one is attributing a flagrant contradiction to him. Okay. But second, one should not attribute such a contradiction to someone like Kant, because he's so great and he's a systematic philosopher. Therefore, one should reject the unrestricted reading of Kant's stated moral universalism. And Wapping goes on to say, most scholars who are interested in sorting out the relation between Kant's racism and his practical philosophy tend to accept premise one, contradiction, but they deny, as you pointed out, Charles Mill's conclusion by rejecting too, right? Well, then he just simply is not a consistent moral universalist, just isn't one. So this is sort of sums up, I think, the, the, some of the key goals that Wapping has when it comes to pointing out the non-contradiction in, in Kant's race work. And a big part of this, what really underpins the arguments she makes here, and I think really convincingly done. Um, on page 43, that's where the discussion starts, very clear statement, Kantian universality is not to be conflated with mere generality. So what is defined as morally universal, universalizable is not meant to be generalizable to the whole of humanity, right? The next important contrib contribution um, which Wapping successfully does in this chapter especially is to counter the view that the role and attention that should be given to race and racism in Kant's work has been inflated. Right? So this is an argument that Robert 
um, Loudoun makes, but there are many other examples um, elsewhere whenever race is discussed or addressed. Um, because as she skillfully shows, race was actually integral to Kant's systemic philosophical project. And if you fail to recognize that, then Kant's own intent is distorted or ignored. So in that sense, she is, I think, the only person I can think of who truly does take up John Mickelson's challenge, right? that if we truly recognize the fundamental role that race plays in Kant's systemic thinking, and we give him the credit of being a systemic um, systematic philosopher, it would require a radical reconfiguration of his entire compendium of ideas. And I think Huaping seeking to and moving towards doing that with the book. The next big contribution of this chapter is that Huaping convincingly argues that when Kant speaks about the progress of the human species, there's an assumption that he means this collectively. Um, sorry, the, there's an assumption that he means this individually. Whereas actually, when he's talking about the progress of the human species, he's meaning this in a collective manner. So what's the upshot of this? It means the former, right, the collective, the human species may well get there, right, to the pinnacle of human and moral progress, but may well leave some races and individuals behind. And that's completely compatible with the notion of seeking and believing in the possibility of progress for the entire human species. Not only may some races and individuals get left behind, in fact, they may well, may well have to be left behind, right? In order for the human species to reach that pinnacle. And if the latter falls by the wayside, it is due to their own deficiencies, not because of anything that a superior race has forced on them. The fourth point, um, or significant contribution, I think, um, there are other scholars that have pointed this one out, but it's laid out uh, in a clear way in this chapter. And this is the importance, the weight that Kant gives to um, providence or nature. And in many ways, this allows Kant off the hook, right? because it makes it look like he's merely a narrator right? of, um, of the history of humanity. Right? He's just describing. And so this is the idea that it's providence or nature which plays a role in racial deficiencies, um, which plays a role in denying some races their equal place in civilizational progress. And so effectively, this isn't about Kant being racist, it's just describing, observing a reality. And the final point I want to focus on um, before my time is up is the importance of qualifying how we define universalism and how we define the human when we're looking at Kant's race work. And if, again, this speaks to some of the questions that came up in the previous session. And it's recognizing that moral universalism for Kant is predicated on a demarcation already that he has made um, of who has reason, who is capable of reason, and who is not. Right? So by the time that we get to his teleology um, and the pinnacle of, of human progress, right, we are only really talking about um, a superior race that is capable of reason. And so you have these three levels, right? Um, starting out with, as you mentioned in your presentation, the physical geography, then you have the pragmatic uh, anthropology, and finally you have the pure moral philosophy. So everything's been ironed out before we get to the pure moral philosophy. <laughs> I think I'll just mention uh, just a very short word on Kant's supposed um, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, if you like. Um, yes, absolutely, and I think this is where some of the, um, the notion of contradiction and confusion understandably arises. Um, but the point that is made in this chapter, Wapping, and also my interpretation of it, um, is that for Kant, the anti-colonialism, the problem with colonialism is all, it's an intra-European concern. And it's the fact that this prevents Europeans from reaching their full moral potential and civilizational progress, right? It's a stain and it's a smear for them rather than what it is subjecting those who are colonized to. Right? Um, nevertheless, he does also make space for it in recognizing this could be simply a result of providence and it may have to happen. But at some points, we as a, a superior Western white race, European race, need to move beyond it. Right? 
if we're going to reach that pinnacle. So it might may well be anti-imperialist, but is it ethically um, anti-imperialist? And is it anti-imperialist because of what it might be doing to those who are colonized? Um, so I think at that point, so I will end with um, my, uh, my uh, comments on the actual chapter and the contributions. And I, I want to just pose a question for Huaping to perhaps um, reflect on after this, which is, given that you've, you've written this book, and huge congratulations, um, and I hope it's a, a massive success, and it should be, um, how now do you deal with um, Kant's work and the fact that you are, uh, you're a scholar of Kant, your, your work has focused on, on Kant and his theories, does this negate what you've written before, or um, does it mean it makes it harder to write on anything but Kant and his racism and his raciology? Um, I suppose the second question I would ask is, how do you bring this into the classroom? And um, excellent Zoom workshop that was organized last year, um, Reza, that you organized, and I think there are a few of us in the room who are present. Um, and I think this question or this discussion came up, right, is um, yes, we acknowledge his, some of his ideas, many of his ideas were racist. Um, we may even convey that to our students, but what are we telling them as a result of that, right? Is it therefore do not take Kant into consideration in your work, or yes, do, but always acknowledge the racism, or is there something deeper that we're asking our students to move forward with? In, in knowing this, or is it just about the truth, right? Is it just about the truth telling when it comes to our students? And how, for students of color in the classroom, might there be different implications for acknowledging this truth than for students who might come from, a, in the West anyway, the majority um, background? Um, so again, thank you, and, and I'll end there. <laughs>